Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Meng, and welcome to uh, this edition of the Celebrate Our Associate Professors series. Uh, we started this about three years ago as a way to celebrate uh, our recently tenured uh, professor, associate professors in the College of Engineering here, and also to recognize that uh, there have been uh, mentors, there have been collaborators along the process, uh, and we hope that those who are currently PhD students or postdocs, uh, or might be uh, assistant professors uh, in tenure track would also benefit from listening to the research and teaching and engagement activities of our recently tenured colleagues. We are immensely proud of all of our uh, tenured associate professors, I have been directly involved in many of their tenure cases. Uh, and equally importantly, it is to build a community of uh, our colleagues in a way that can encourage more collaboration and conversation and to encourage each and every one of them to now think really big uh, without uh, the typical worry as an assistant professor about the tenure process. So warm congratulations to the four speakers uh, today. And with that, I turn it to, I think maybe to uh, Arvind, if you are there. Yeah, and you know, to, we have, uh, this, is, this is the last uh, COAP event and without further ado, it's my honor to, uh, to uh, introduce uh, Donna Riley, the Kamiar Hagigi head of the School of Engineering Education to introduce our first two speakers and do the Q&A sessions for them too. Over to you, Donna. Thanks, Arvind. And uh, I'm sorry if my internet connection is a problem. I think both both uh, Mung and Arvind were were uh, chopped up for me. So so I hope it's not me, but it probably is me. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer DeBoer. Um, Jennifer obtained her PhD in International Education Policy Studies from Vanderbilt University in 2012. And she holds two bachelor degrees uh, from MIT in both mechanical engineering and foreign languages. And before joining our faculty in engineering education at Purdue in 2014, she served as a postdoc uh, in education research at MIT. And so as you might imagine from this set of um, unique backgrounds, Jennifer's work is um, truly unique in the world. Um, she focuses on international education systems, individual and social development, technology use and STEM learning, and educational environments for diverse, for diverse learners. And um, I'm sure that she'll be talking more about kind of how that, how that plays out in different parts of the world. But I think one of the most unique things about her work is her studies with, dis, with displaced people around the world. So that includes homeless folks here in the US, um, folks whose lives are disrupted by violence um, on other continents. And in particular, she, um, she works with those folks to leverage engineering education as a tool both to improve the, um, the immediate environments in which they work and to facilitate opportunities for um, permanent uh, relocation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Uh, and thank you, Donna. That's a, um, a perfect uh, introduction um, uh, for what I'm going to focus on uh, in my talk. Uh, again, my name is Jennifer DeBoer, and I'm, of course, an associate professor now of engineering education uh, with a courtesy appointment in uh, mechanical engineering, um, I'm director of research of the Mechanical Engineering Education Research Center, uh, Meerkat at Purdue. Um, and uh, as Dr. Riley said, my research group studies the, the pedagogical, technological, and policy tools that can support um, marginalized learners creating solutions for their own communities. Um, as I was reflecting uh, in preparation for this talk um, on, on where I'm at uh, it, and, and this brief opportunity to share, I was thinking about uh, this place in my career uh, and realized right now this, this whole time frame parallels the, the full life cycle of, of one of my projects. Um, and in particular, one that uh, uh, I'm focusing on uh, in this talk, uh, uh, localized engineering and displacement. So I'll, I'll talk about this as an example um, and reflect on how uh, my work has evolved, but uh, this kind of full circle over the last six or seven years um, uh, reflects uh, some of the other work that I do in uh, mechanical engineering education tools, uh, online learning and broadening participation. 
Um, so what I'm showing on this uh, first slide is a map of a, a refugee camp that was designed uh, as a temporary solution. In this case, it was a temporary solution uh, to the Syrian crisis. Uh, and this camp was built in uh, 2014. And it was built as an emergency response. It was, it was built to be taken down. Uh, seven years later, it's become really permanent in infrastructure. It's a permanent fixture in uh, the desert in northeastern Jordan. And it really illustrates the uh, tension that's inherent in displacement and that has become a, a core facet uh, to my research. Really understanding how what is treated as an emergency that requires immediate, often uh, less robust humanitarian aid solutions is becoming a, a long-term situation. Uh, and uh, again, as, as Donna had said, uh, displacement in my work can include cross-border migration like the Syrian crisis, which is moving people into Jordan, uh, internal displacement, um, like the current uh, fast-growing crisis in the Tigray region in Ethiopia, or homelessness and the challenge of being unhoused. Um, and, and whether it's in the US or in Kenya, which is the example that I'm, I'm going to face, uh, displacement is often addressed as a short-term crisis rather than what it realistically turns into, which is a more long-term uh, systemic issue that requires more uh, robust uh, technical solutions. And so this causes a number of technical needs to arise, um, uh, including uh, uh, things like uh, food insecurity, um, uh, energy systems, as communities are uprooted, uh, existing systems are uprooted. Uh, so as communities move to another place and they have to uh, reestablish their ties, uh, a number of, of technical needs arise. And so uh, one of the major developments in my work in uh, this first phase of my career has been the development of an engineering education solution to this issue. Uh, which is recentering and relocalizing the expertise that is needed to solve these technical problems, uh, building on concepts like an ethics of care, uh, asset-based frameworks and funds of knowledge in what we've started calling localized engineering and displacement, uh, a model for uh, responding to um, and, and closing the, the loop um, to the displacement issue. Um, so this model uses uh, active learning uh, activities, uh, which we know from uh, myriad research uh, is, is better for students learning. Uh, blended tools, uh, which includes online and face-to-face -face and has allowed us to be fairly adaptable um, in our cross-national work, especially during uh, COVID times. Um, collaborative learning, where we have local teams of learners in displaced communities collaborating with each other on the ground, uh, collaborating with uh, my team here at Purdue and, and collaborating with partners around the world and democratic learning where students themselves are deciding what needs should be addressed and how by their solutions. So this curricular model recenters the students and the local, local expertise. And uh, the example that I'll trace is uh, in collaboration with uh, students and teachers at the Tumaini Innovation Center which is an alternative school for homeless youth, youth in Kenya, which has been a close collaborator since the very first year here, um, starting out with a seed grant from what is now called the Shaw Lab for International Development. Um, so the, the four research aims in my work uh, in this example that I'll go through really illustrate how my work has evolved uh, since I came to Purdue in 2014. So we began by focusing on the students who are at the center of this, focusing on their learning and asking research questions like, what are the engineering ways of thinking and being? Uh, what can we learn about student self-efficacy and self-concept as an engineer um, in this learning environment? And what are the psychosocial uh, measures of well-being uh, that we see students achieve? We're using uh, methods and methodologies like qualitative interviews and observations. Um, uh, text assessments and uh, motivational and attitudinal surveys. Uh, so you can see here students uh, early on in our work uh, explaining technical concepts in solar photovoltaic systems and power calculations uh, to the US ambassador to Kenya who was visiting Tumaini at the time. So this was how our, our work started, but we very quickly then realized that in order to, uh, uh, to foster local learning and uh, work with students, we had to collaborate with teachers. Um, so very uh, quickly, uh, the second phase of uh, this research 
evolved into fostering local expertise and collaborating with teachers uh, with the research aim of uh, teacher development. And this has largely uh, been uh, through methods like teacher action research and the facilitation of a community of practice, uh, qualitative interviews, and things like uh, what you see in this picture, uh, one of the teachers completing a series of journaling prompts as part of teacher action research. Uh, and I want to note here too that this is very um, illustrative of our teacher collaborators at Tumaini. The majority of the teachers we worked with uh, early on and, and even now were women who are in leadership and teaching roles. Um, for predominantly uh, uh, male students. As our implementation, implementation work uh, evolved, we continued um, a longer thread of my scholarship, which has been taking a really fine grain and critical look at um, the uh, learning behaviors and technologies um, that students are using, uh, where these work and where they don't and for whom. So looking at student learning behaviors as they're using digital tools, like the ones that you see here, where we can use inferential statistics and data mining to actually track what students are doing, see how they study, how they answer questions, and are, how they're developing a conceptual understanding of engineering while using uh, edu educational technologies um, like this one. So that's been a really um, a, a long-term ongoing thrust of, of our work. And finally, uh, the keystone and really the main future direction for this work is collaborating on research teaching research skills to our students and our partners so they can lead on developing new knowledge and continuing the research and development that's necessary um, for uh, really closing the, uh, this life cycle of, of uh, localizing engineering and displacement. Um, that has often uh, meant participatory research methods. Uh, and here you see the director of the center overseeing both two Chinese students and actually Purdue Study Abroad students uh, researching and trialing a microcontroller solution to a need that they had identified and learned relevant concepts for um, and iterated uh, and developed the solution. And actually later on the same day, they themselves were conducting market research. So the Purdue and Tumaini students were learning while doing, going out into the community to conduct market research. And uh, the result of that market research is this last step in um, the life cycle that has just happened in the last couple months. Um, so about six years of this story from start to finish, uh, which is a small business proposal for a solar powered security system that households across the local Capsoya community around Tumaini are interested in purchasing. Um, and just uh, now a couple months ago, um, uh, won a national business accelerator grant uh, for $30,000 um, in the Mbele Nabi's competition, which means move the business forward. Um, so you see the student here who's going to be the lead on the small business and he'll actually be leading along with a co-founder who's one of the women teachers um, and oversees the engineering course at Tumaini. So this is really the life cycle of localized engineering displacement, moving from formerly homeless youth who have been displaced uh, to learning, not just learning a trade, but learning to engineer solutions, developing a solution based on their newly rooted understanding of their, of their local host community, to building a solution um, and uh, uh, not just building temporary shelters, but, but what we're calling building for life and reestablishing community um, to close the loop and reroute um, those displaced communities. Um, so with that, I wanna thank, um, of course, uh, my whole group. I'm here, not just as myself, um, but as uh, my research group, the students and collaborators we work with, um, my mentors, the engineering education community, um, Purdue, and of course, um, the Shaw Lab and uh, NSF. I was going to ask you, what would you tell your earlier self that you know now? I would, I would probably say um, uh, to have a little bit more faith in yourself <laughs> and that um, when uh, there are hard decisions that you know that you have to take, um, stick, stick with it. Um, and I think that would have been helpful <laughs> to my earlier self. Not that I didn't um, uh, stick with what we, I think, knew was the, the right path, but it can be hard sometimes, um, you know, when you grants don't come through or you're doing something that's like a little bit different. Um, so I think that's, that would be the, the message. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. I see Arvin waving. Looks I don't like know if you can see him. Yeah, Arvin. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I do. Speaking of technical abilities, I didn't figure out the ability to raise my hand on this call. I apologize. <laughs> but uh, Jennifer, you know, I've been so uh, delighted to, uh, so proud and delighted to see how <clears throat> uh, all your engagement and research, and it's hard to distinguish what's research, what's engagement, and how they've uh, expanded. And I just wanted to also, uh, you know, for the benefit of everyone, also. Uh, you know, just just add a piece to this that you know Jennifer's group has become probably one of the key uh, you know linchpins, if you will, of uh, uh, you know our engagement in uh, Western Kenya. Um, you know, we now have a what is it a building in the IU uh, uh, you know uh, complex yeah. there that's you know mm -hmm. thanks to Jennifer Purdue House for the Purdue House within the <laughs> IU House. Um, so that's great. Just, I guess a question was uh, maybe reflecting on, you know, you, you jumped into this international piece and then, you know, there was an, probably an interaction that happened, right? So you initially went in maybe with a seed grant and, you know, to do certain things, uh, <clears throat> but it's clearly seeing, you know, looking at, looking back at how that interaction shaped, uh, you know, your own future research agenda. Uh, you know, can you speak to how interacting in the field, and the reason I bring it up is that, you know, some faculty may, you know, may hesitate, you know, from jumping into, uh, you know, going along the path that you did, but maybe if you can speak to how that field experience helped shape your own research vision moving forward uh, and your own engagement mission, teaching mission going forward, uh, if you could speak to that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think um, I think it's it's we as researchers are are trained to um, kind of be experts and defend our, our expertise. I think one of the things that's been really valuable being in the field has um, been um, learning all the things that I don't know, um, and it's I think sometimes hard for us as researchers to to say we don't know things. Um, but uh, working with um, collaborators in a number of, of different places has allowed I think it's strengthened my research um, because uh, it has um, pointed out all of the things that that I don't know, all the failure points, all the ways in which um, technologies and, and solutions uh, can fail. Um, that if we're just kind of focusing on um, experiments in the lab, we're, we're not really going to be testing um, solutions in all of the conditions under which they can, they can fail. Um, so that I think has been uh, important for my research and I'll show one of the um, uh, additional slides that I had um, that just kind of shows all of the different, um, the number of students that we've we've come into contact with. And I, I put a note up here, this doesn't even include the, the hundreds of students in um, the global learning community section of 131 who are seeing exactly what, what you're kind of asking about, um, that working in um, the real world and working in a number of different diverse field conditions um, allows us to, to be better engineers because it points out um, all of the ways that, um, all the things that we don't know, which is really valuable. 